see if you know anything. <laughs> you already know that answer. I don't have a clue. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. That's good. So, uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I work here part time <laughs> because I'm old, but I've been around a long time. Uh, Dave Taylor is our service director. He went hunting and uh, he, he's uh, hunting powder. Uh, he's got a big, huge old Henry in his shoes. So, anyway, it's just me, so be gentle because I haven't winterized a coach in a while and, and uh, I don't know everything. So, ask a lot of questions and we'll get through this together. Uh, if you have this, this, this winterize is about coaches that do not have hydronic heating, which means the big diesel pushers like his, uh, he's just here for the free food. When you have hydronic heating, uh, that's a small boiler system, and uh, if you heard, I offered Ted a dollar to come and tell you everything he knows, but he won't do it. Because on diesel pushers, if you have hydronic heating, all diesel pushers do, um, it is not something that we feel that you should actually be doing. If you have been in the industry and you've had a motor home for 100 years, yeah, get with the manufacturer and, and they'll talk to you about it. Uh, there's safety issues. Uh, you have to purge the system and pump it through, and it, it, is, it is a boiler system, so we prefer not to do it. Uh, we can do it, but we prefer you not. I think we charge uh, $99, which is cheap. And if you have a washer-dryer, uh, they're getting more chairs for you guys. Uh, if you Sorry, have... Guys. If you have a washer dryer, it's a, it's 20 bucks more. If you have a water filter, it's 20 bucks more. If you have an ice maker, it's 20 bucks more. So the hydronic heating is going to cost a customer about 160 to 180 dollars a year to have it winterized. But most diesel pusher owners go south, so they don't they don't really care. Having said that, there's a lot of people here. Uh, yes, sir. Are you going to talk about trailers too? Yeah, that's what, what the whole thing's going to be about. Anything other than a diesel pusher. So if you if you have a diesel pusher, we're pretty, pretty much done. You can leave. So everybody should have a handout. This is something I like to do that we didn't do in the past. But the handout is a pretty thorough how to for winterizing the coach, step by step, and we'll go through it. But I want to talk about a couple other items first. Um, when I started in this industry, my daughter was three years old. Are you looking for and you know, I've been in it 40 years, so do the math. Is that like so, 100 years ago? Yes, yeah. and, and back then we, we had rocks for tires, yes. So oh, anyway. education too. Huh? That's okay. So, one of the first things that I did is I made a poop stick and put her name on it. She took it to preschool and they colored all over it so I could never use it again. So you want to know what a poop stick is. So during your winterize, you deep down there, you're going to see where you need to run water through the truck toilet, flush it out, and then instead of just standing there holding the pedal down, uh, hopefully we're getting more chairs. Holy cow. There's more. Wow. So anyway, this is going to keep coming. This is a, this poop stick, if you drop it down in the throat of the toilet, it won't fall through to the holding tank and it'll hold the valve open so that the, the water and the air can flow through the valve and, and you don't have to just stand there and hold the pedal down. So that's what these are for. They're easy to make, a scrap of wood, it just has to be wider than the throat of the toilet. 
when, you're, when we're going around and you'll see when it becomes important. Easy to make, work really well. What I want to do is identify these items beforehand and then we'll go through the whole system. This is for suburban water heaters. Uh, suburban water heaters have an, an anode because their tank is a steel tank that has a glass lining just like the one in your house. Atwood water heaters are aluminum. This is an Atwood and it's aluminum and it has a nice big split here because it won't be They do not require an anode because uh, this anode is a sacrificial material uh, because you have electrolysis in your system. This absorbs the electrolysis and this is eroded where Atwood thinks they just, they'll let their tank be eaten up and in 10 years you put a new tank in. So if you have a Suburban, you will have to remove this for winterizing and this is how they look when they're brand new. When you take it out, if it is shot, it looks like a welding rod. And there is a steel rod in the middle and it's, it's corroded. Now people bring these in all the time and there's a little gone here, a little gone there. No, you use it for four or five years. When you winterize, you take it out, you kind of rinse it off and, and leave it out. It'll dry and then next year you put it back in when you de-winterize. So you wear this and it'll eat down until there's almost no rod left. And that's when you want to replace it. If you have been to any of our seminars before, you have seen this little rinse wand. When you take the plug out of your water heater, and it's an inch and an eighth or an inch and a sixteenth plug, it can either be metal or plastic, it's down. Right down in there is a little plug, that's the drain plug for your water heater. And it either, if it's a suburban, it will be the steel, which is an inch and an eighth. If it is an atwood, it will be plastic, right here. Is it an atwood and open? Yeah, probably. But this plastic plug, you take it out. And if you've ever been here, folks, my mom's oatmeal. When you take that plug out, you don't stand right in front of it because it'll spray this garbage all over you. And this stuff, we got this a little, this is just a little bit of what we took out of one water heater. And what it is, is it's a hard water deposit that you have in your house that it's in your water heater. This is a hard water mineral rock that ends up in the bottom of your water heater. And it's, it's just grit, sand, looks just like it is sand because that's basically what it is. So when you're getting ready to winterize, you take the plug out of your water heater and it'll spray some of this out. And then, after you're done with that, you buy one of these and you hook it up to your hose and it has an on and off spigot and you stick it into that hole, turn it on and it'll blast the other three quarters of my mom's oatmeal out uh, and you can rinse out the bottom of your tank. That plug is about this height right here so anything below that point right there will not drain out and that's why all of this stuff collects there. So these are cheap, they really work good. I'm sorry? It's just a rinser. Same tank, savers, tank, rinser, whatever. Just stick it in there and rinse it around for a few minutes until none of the crap comes out. And then that your water heater is clean. Yes ma'am. Is it the collection of that what makes the water heater safe? Yes. Um, what you're not seeing is this is dry now, so all of the 
slime and what happened is in your system, the water heater is the catch-all. And anything that came in through city water, through your potable water, it's going to end up in the bottom of the water heater. So once a year in the fall, when you winterize, it's a really good idea to rinse it out. Use this thing just now. If you have a water Sorry? If you have a water list, a water Potable water tank. Uh, those, the water is the hot water, but it's waterless, the heater. Tankless. She's talking about tank, tankless water heater. Oh, okay. I know what you're saying. On demand. So the lady is asking about what you do with a tankless water heater, on demand water heater. It, it all depends. That's a big can of worms, but uh, there's there's three different brands out there. There's Gerard, Atwood, and Truma, and it all depends on which one you have, which is how you winterize. And if you're not, I think the Truma does not have a tank. One of them, I think the Atwood has a tank, and there's a special way to do it. You get a hold of your Atwood owner manual, and the same with Truma or with. Gerard. Now, Truma just has a little button you push and it's done because it, it, it's designed, you turn it to the winterized mode and it flushes itself out. And there's a drain pet cock, but I, I would have to refer you to your owner's manual because each of the three brands have their own way of doing it. They're fairly simple, but some are simpler than others. But that's just for the tanks. And am I as clear as mud on this? Yeah, I'm worried. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, have, I have one in my cabin and I didn't know you had, I didn't have tank, so I didn't know you had a it, it, it depends on the brand and yeah. it'll tell you how to do it. And yeah. um, that's why we have Dave, uh, because he's the service manager forever and he's done it forever. I haven't <laughs> held a wrench commercially for 30 years, so I, I don't know. That's, it's not, so I'm going to tell you, look at your owner's manual, because I don't know. They're, they're all different, though, because they, they all came with the idea from a different angle. They all have different philosophies, and they're all designed different. So, question? question. You said there's two main types of tanks like that, and you, would, you need to do the flushing on either one of those? Yeah. The, you, there's the Atwood and Suburban. This is an Atwood. Uh, it's a little tank. It has a drain in the front. Uh, it does not have the anode like the Suburbans do. It just has a plastic plug. You stand at the side and you let it out, then you rinse it. If you have a Suburban, you take the anode out, you stand inside it, let it drain out, rinse it out. But two different brands. One of the Suburban is a steel tank with glass lining. That one is the aluminum. Uh, suburban is probably going to last a little bit longer, but so that's it's just different designs. <coughs> do you have a question? How do you know which one you have in the um, Can somebody go out and look at it? Well, you can fold the door down and. Uh, It'll tell you on the side right here or right here which brand it is. So if you don't want to bring it here, you uh, Well, they're going to be working on that, so I'll just. Yeah. <coughs> there are two ways to winterize a coach besides bringing it to us. If you just want to drain it and blow the lines out, that's good for down around 25 degrees. If, if you're around here draining the lines, blowing the water air, or using air to blow the water out of the lines, does a great job because any little residual water isn't going to amount to enough water to cause a huge, any, any amount of damage. If you live on the other side of the mountains, uh, in Washington or Oregon, you're going to need to pump antifreeze through the system to actually displace the water with antifreeze. This antifreeze 
RV non-toxic, you can drink it, it tastes like mud, but you can drink it, it's not going to kill you, uh, it, it's non-toxic. The interesting thing is, is, when I was in college and I was just learning about RVs, really nice old guy owned this RV shop, he said, you know, you put some of this in a glass and put it in your freezer and see what it does. And what it does is it freezes hard as a rock, but it doesn't expand. And the difference is, it, it will be in your lines, frozen solid, but it will not expand, so it will not damage your plumbing. That's the difference between, water has a coefficient of expansion of around 10%, I think it's 7 to 8%. And uh, it, it's interesting, you know why at the bottom of the ocean, where it's like 10,000 feet deep, the temperature is 4 degrees? Because at 40 degrees, the water is at its densest point. Once you drop below that, it starts to expand. The molecules are, they're most organized at 4 degrees. So that's why the oceans don't get any colder than 4 degrees. Now, if you take that water and put it in a, a container and run it up to the, to the uh, surface, It'll be hard as a rock because you've taken all the pressure away, so it will freeze solid. That pressure is what's holding it at its densest point. Now, we're not at the bottom of the ocean, so if it's 15 degrees out, this, this stuff's going to be hard as a rock, but it won't expand. So, if you want to just... Question? Okay. Don't hesitate to yell if you if you want to know something. That's not yelling. <laughs> Antifreeze. What's that in your filter? Well, we're going to get to that. And if you look in there, it says to remove the filters. I can't find out where they're at. I mean, I have a replacement one in the closet, but I don't know where the other the real one is. Um, usually, it's under the sink. I'm sorry, dear. No, a lot of them. It's it's. 90% of RVs, when they're brand new, they do not have a filter. Um, some do, most don't. It's something people add after the fact. And we can get into filters if you want. Uh, I know a lot about filters. So, um, we'll get to that, we'll come back to the filters. Yes? So, what if you're using the motor The latest question is, what if you're using the motor home during the winter months? Good question. Um, there's no reason for you not to use it, you just can't use the plumbing system. If, let's say you go skiing, and I used to love to ski when I was younger, and I'd go up there in my camper, and it would, at Crystal Mountain, it would be like 5, 10 degrees. So if you have to go to the bathroom, you have to go out and go inside uh, the chalet, or whatever they call those things and use their facilities because the holding tanks on most RVs are exposed, they're up down underneath. If you don't have a winter package on your RV, and uh, most trailers and little fifth wheels do not, a winter package has more insulation, plus they insulate the holding tanks and they put heat down into the holding tanks. So if you have the winter package, you can use your RV just like normal. If you don't have it and it's winterized, you can use the heat, you can cook, but you, you need, uh, you can't use the plumbing system. If you use the plumbing system and you flush the toilet, even dumping water down there so that you're not using the plumbing, that water and that organic material are going to go to the holding tank and it goes down to the end of the holding tank where the, the ABS plastic is, and ABS plastic splits right now. So what you're doing is you're putting water into a holding tank so that it can freeze, because the holding tanks are exposed underneath the coach. And they're going to freeze hard as a rock, and in the spring when you thaw it out, you're going to have 100 leaks around your, your termination. All that black plastic plumbing for your dump tanks is going to be split seen it a hundred times. So, if you don't have insulated tanks, 
you really should not use the plumbing system if it's going to freeze because you will cause damage. You can have bottled water, you can, you just have to use different facilities if you've got to go. And a lot of campgrounds, they have restrooms and, and showers and things like that. But so then in, in this climate here in Atlanta Valley, when do you recommend maybe that you've got things winterized? Well, you, the, the, the question is, is how do you know you've got everything winterized? You bring it in for a hundred bucks and have us do it. And then, you but know. When? At what point? Well, yeah. Oh, at what point? No. Well, let's see, the last three nights it was 34 at my house, and I got a bunch of walnut trees, and so um, it's probably a little bit cooler now. So I would say the next couple of weeks, uh, if you look on the side of the building here, we have 20 55-gallon drums of antifreeze, and we will consume at least twice that much. That's just for this building, and there's 20-some up at the other building. So now is when you need to start doing it. That's when we're starting right now. Yes, sir. We have one that's uh -huh. 32 degrees is an automatic. Yeah. Very good question. What was the question? I can't hear you. I'm, I'm sorry? What was his question? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to repeat it. So he lives on the coast, and seeing 32 degrees hardly ever happens. So his question was, what should I worry about it? And I would say, no, you have some choices if you want peace of mind. But that brings up another question, another topic. <clears throat> when do you need to worry about winterizing? So let's say that you're, you're packed, ready to go, and you're going to go somewhere for the weekend and come back before you go teach. And you, you want to leave it usable. Let's say that you go somewhere, you camp overnight, it gets down to 27 degrees. It's 68 inside. The plumbing is always along the outside edges, unless it goes into the toilet or into under the shower. But the plumbing is all along the edges. So if you if you have your coach somewhere where it's going to get into the mid 20s for overnight, so you leave your furnace on and you open the little inside cabin doors so that air can, warm air can get in under the bed and places like that. It'll be fine. We have found that if you, if your coach is not winterized and you have a night where it dips down in the mid-twenties, it may freeze, but it won't freeze hard because the, by the time the, the, the whole coach is down to, let's say, 25, 26 degrees, it's already warming up outside, and it hasn't really been a hard freeze on the plumbing. If it's going to go down to 20, and it's going to stay below 20 for two days, you're screwed. It's going to freeze solid. You're going to have problems. The first problem you're going to have is your faucet in your kitchen is going to come apart. You know, the, the, the top part's going to just lift off you know that that point you, you you have issues. The next thing is, is the toilet valve freezes and you go in and you turn the water on. Now you got water all over the floor. And the third thing is the shower goes. So those are the first three indicators that you lost. But if it's just going to be in the mid 20s overnight, you should be fine. Yes. Yeah. The question is, how long does it take an expert to know if it has the winter package? And without looking in the brochures or anything, if you just look where your whole tanks are, your fresh water tank is usually under the bed. That's not the issue. Would you like to share? Oh, I'm not saying that. the gray and black tank are hanging down exposed, you do not have a winter package. If the tanks are up inside 
uh, under the floor? You probably do. And then you go look in your flyer, brochure, owner's manual, and it will discuss whether you have the heat package of the winter cold package. And you may even have tank heaters, a little rocker switch that, that comes on and, and it'll heat your tanks. The, the caution we have about tank heaters is, is they have to have material in them. You've got to have about a third of a tank of, of water in your gray and black tanks. Otherwise, that tank heater just melts the plastic. You have to be very careful about turning those on. So, before we get to... I'm sorry? Can we add a winter package? Very expensive because you have to build some kind of a cover with insulation around the holding tanks and then you have to be able to put heat in there. Um, I would have to say, you know, five, six thousand dollars. We would not do it. Now, that in the past, there was a guy up near Wilsonville, uh, uh, not quite near Wilsonville, that sprayed on foam. And they would stick the tank heaters to the bottom of the tank, and then they would put about three inches of spray on foam under it, and this ugly yellow foam was hanging down. And, and I think that if, personally, if, if I was to start winter camping again, I would trade vehicles because if you spend thousands of dollars on having somebody do it, they're not going to be able to look you in the eye and say, we've done that good a job. You're probably going to still have problems because you just, you'd have to tear the whole coach apart and redo so many parts of it to do it. So I would say in this case, that would be a good justification to trade up a little bit because they, those systems, those winter packages work really well. So back to where I wanted to talk, there's two different ways to winterize a coach. One is blow the lines out, two is pump antifreeze through. For around here, blowing the lines out is more than satisfactory. As long as you have a compressor that can deliver a high amount of air. We have found that the correct way to blow the lines out is to have a compressor that can deliver a fairly steady 60 to 80 PSI. And the reason is, when you do this, and we're going to go through it here in a few minutes, when you do this, we need a huge amount of volume of air to scavenge out the low points where water collects. So if you do not, you just have a little, little tiny electric compressor, don't bother, it's not going to work. You have to have a big one that really moves some air by. If you do, these things are neat. What these are, are little fittings that go into your city water entry and they have the nipple on them, which is a link and short for your uh, air hose. And it just plugs right in. And we have the really good brass ones, we have the okay ones, and then we have the really cheap ones. And Anyway, these things work really good if you have good airflow. I've got them up here when we're done. You can come and look at them. I, my, I, did, I, almost, I did that. I put your little TV on my compressor. And then I was afraid to use it because I wanted the nozzle to control the volume. I was afraid I'd blast the lines out. That's kind of cool. Well, that's a nice one. <laughs> yeah, but... Okay, Otherwise, but... I put pressure in the tank. I can't control too much how much pressure... Yeah. I was told not to get over 40 PSI. Yeah, then, then don't do it. Yeah, we... Okay. The, the, the question is, I, she was told never to put more than 40 PSI in her coach. And that's not really quite true. Our campground is at 59 PSI. And we've, we've spent a ton of money with the city making sure that we had the latest equipment to hold that pressure. It will not go over 59 PSI. And it, I don't think it's ever been under 59. It's a very steady pressure. 
These RVs, pick one. Let's say you have a used 1984 Cascade camper. Low, low quality. It is designed with this kind of pipe plumbing. These, these coaches all are designed to, to live at anywhere from 40 to 60 PSI. The newer stuff from, oh, turn of the century on, 2000 or newer, are designed to live with pressures of 60 to 80 PSI. So it gets ugly at around 80 PSI. If you've got a coach with 100,000 miles on it, you're gonna hook up to 80 PSI. You're gonna find every little loose fitting, every little crack, every little thing in there because that's a pretty good pressure. 60 PSI, you can take a wonderful shower, everything works right. That's, that's about optimal. Uh, the cheap pressure regulators that we have are 40 to 45, and if you use those, you're going to find that you can't hardly take a shower. Some of the faucets don't work so good. So, as long as we're on that topic, the best thing to do if you're in a new campground is buy yourself one of those adjustable pressure regulators just so that you can hook it up in there and say, oh look, I've got 55 PSI. Yes. Then, you're, you're under 60, you're doing just fine. Take it out, put it back in your toolbox, and run it without a pressure regulator. The pressure regulators come in when you're on a, a, in a campground where they have well water and they turn it on and the pressure goes up to 90 and then they let it go down to about 30. And in the old campgrounds, that was really common. So everybody had pressure regulators to make sure that when the pump, well pump was on, it didn't blow your plumbing. Nowadays, we don't see that very often, so... <laughs> was that you that I was having this conversation with on that plumbing, the, the pressure regulator? No, okay. If you've got... Oh, I'm sorry. She's asking what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about... Oh, where it goes, where it goes, yes. Yeah. That, oh, that, yeah, that. So the, the, she wants to know where to put the pressure regulator. Well, you put it right on the hose bib so that it protects the hose and the coach. If you put it on the, the outside of the coach, then your, your hose is exposed to extreme pressure. And sometimes the hose blows even though the, the coach is fine. So you put it on the hose bib and that's where you hook your water up. Yeah, it's called a hose bin. So, the, the faucet outside, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you put it right out there at that faucet thingy. Before your hose. Before your hose. Yes, and a lot of people, God bless them, like to leave their pressure regulator for the next camper. So, <laughs> what we do, is you get some duct tape or electrical tape and you put it on really snug onto your hose and then tape it up good. That way when you go to take your hose off, you go, oh, wait a minute, that's mine. Yeah, that's mine. So anyway, our philosophy is once you get to know a campground, if the pressure is a fairly consistent 60 or less PSI. Don't use a pressure regulator because the pressure regulator has a pressure drop of anywhere from 5 to 10 PSI. And if it's running at 40 PSI and you drop it down to 35, you can't take a shower with that. That's not enough pressure for most people to shower because the showers are restricted anyway. So if you've got good known pressure below 60, don't use the pressure rate. Oh, lady back here. Um, after it's all blown out, put a quarter cup of antifreeze in each drain. Yeah. Okay. Do I still need to put liquids in there on top of that, or should there not be any liquids at all in there after that?
I'm getting to that. But your answer to the question is, it says in here, two-thirds of the way down, when you're done winterizing, put a cup of antifreeze down each track. Uh, the, that is what you do uh, when you're all done. Now, your P-trap comes from the strainer that goes like this, and there's always liquid in the bottom of that P-trap that keeps the stick from the tank from percolating back up. But after you've winterized it, that P-trap is full of water, and it's ABS, and it splits even if you look at an ice cube. So what we do is we pour about a cup of antifreeze down each track. Bathroom sink, kitchen sink, shower, you've got to put it in each one so that you're displacing the water and the antifreeze will freeze, but it won't swell up and break the P-trap. So I don't need the antifreeze in the tank, actually. I just need it in that trap. Just in the trap. We're not, we're not trying to put any antifreeze into the tanks. We're trying to just, a cup of water is more than enough to displace the water in the pea trap. And that brings up another question. I grew up in Idaho, and it gets cold there, so I learned all of this the hard way. So if you put a little bit of stuff in your holding tanks, it runs right down to the termination where the black ABS plastic is. So what we do is you get through the years of RV and you break one of the ears off of your termination cap. Well, don't throw it away. Take a drill and drill a bunch of little holes in it and then put it back on after you've winterized it. That way there's air coming in and out and the tank can dry out. Any moisture in there will run out but cats and mice can't crawl up in there and make a nest because that's kind of hard on them once the, you get it. So anyway, um, we're not trying to get any kind of fluids at all into the tanks. We want to drain them. So you're saying cup. Uh, I'm sorry? You're saying cup. Yeah, cup. I'm, I'm sorry? I'm just thinking it says a quarter. Would a cup be better? I wrote that a long time ago. I was probably drinking too much beer. In, in, in case, I would guess a half a cup or something, so you just it comes to the gallon jug. You got lots. Yeah, you got plenty, thank you. Okay. So there are two kinds of this stuff while we're talking about this. This is boiler fluid. You don't want to know about it. You don't want to buy it. This is not this is for the people with hydraulic heating that, that we're not going to talk to today. This is regular RV antifreeze. Everybody sells it. And once in a while you see somebody selling it concentrated, just to add water. Excuse me? <laughs> so you don't buy the concentrated, just buy the regular RV antifreeze. That, 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 that kind of antifreeze doesn't go in the RV radiator, right? I'm sorry? No, that's not engine coolant. It's not engine coolant. Yeah. This is RV anti-freeze. But it's a misnomer, and I like that word. It actually freezes, but it doesn't expand, and we, we talked about that. RV antifreeze. So we, we talked about the blowout plugs. Now we're going to talk about the people like me that are... I've done this for 40 years, so I'm a purist. I, 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 it's either got to be done 100% or I'm not going to do it. It's just a personality problem and you know, I've grown up with it. So anyway, there are some of us that no matter what want to pump antifreeze through our system. These things really help. This is an aftermarket version of this bypass. This is what most all of you have if you have a newer coach. In the last 10 years or so, most coaches have this bypass. Now, they may look different, and the theory is the cold water comes in at the bottom, and it's heated, and it comes out the top. So this valve is open, this valve is open, the bypass is closed. And you can tell it's 
open or closed, the handle is always in the direction of flow. So this is open, this is open, this is closed. So it can't go like this. When you winterize it, you want to turn it so that the cold water comes in, bypasses, and goes back out. Nothing is coming into the water heater now, and you can drain it, and you can blow it out. If your coach does not have this really cool bypass kit, your local RV dealer can sell you one. And this is a really nice kit. We sell some not so nice kits, but this is a really nice kit. And somebody that can run a crescent wrench and, and turn this stuff and get down on their knees and do it, this is not that hard to do. If you can get to the back of your water heater with it depressurized, you can install this. It's two valves and a bypass hose. They work really good. If you're going to pump it out, you definitely want one of these. If you're just going to blow it out, you really don't care. Yes? So when you put in your uh, flush out your hot water tank or drain it out, you never get all of it out of the bottom, but that doesn't matter, right? Uh, <laughs> the gentleman's question is, my statement was, when you are flushing out the water here, when you're draining it, taking the plug out, you have a residual amount down in the bottom. When you blast it out with that thing on the floor, uh, you get most of it out, there may be a cup or two, but you leave the, the plug out and it'll evaporate eventually. What you're trying to do is just get all of the particulate out and all that slime out. Once that's done, the rest of it will just evaporate. So, aftermarket bypass kits, if you don't want to do it, the first time you buy your RV, a lot of times we recommend you bring it to a dealer and have them winterize it the first time so next spring you're not faced with all sorts of screw-ups. If you want to do it from then on, you might have us install, or your dealer, whoever, you may have them install one of these. They work really well. If you do not have the factory built-in bypass, these are worthwhile. They save saves all, all that antifreeze, too. That's, why you That's right. A lot of antifreeze. Yeah, if you don't have a bat bypass, basically what you're going to do is fill up the tank. That's six to ten gallons. You had a question, sir? Real quick. This blowing out process of getting the particulates out how often? I'm sorry? Blow out? Yes. Yeah. you just explain how often? Necessary. Well, you do it every fall if you're not going to be using it. I see. Is that is that is that your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every every fall. So that crap collects there every year. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you've been south, all, his question is how often often should you rinse out your 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 water heater and. At least once a year. If you go south and you spend six months down in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Southern California, you do it when you come back because their water is a whole lot worse than ours. It's got so much junk in it. Yeah. You, you, but up here, once a year, if you travel the U.S., there's something like uh, St. Louis. Worst water I ever saw. I mean, it just. Yeah. <laughs> So, last thing before we actually get into how to winterize, if you are a guy that or a gal that wants to winterize pumping the fluid through, this is a neat little deal. And about 1% of the coaches come with them from the factory. And what this is, the, the freshwater plumbing system, it comes from the tank, a very short hose, about a foot long usually, to a filter, to a pump, and then out into the RV. So just before that surefire <coughs> pump and filter, is you put a little T in here, just like in the bypass. And then there's this long tube. Let's say that you want to pump antifreeze through your system. So you turn the valve, put the tube into a gallon of RV antifreeze, you turn the pump on. 
The pump will suck it out of this tube, out of, the, out of this jug. So it's very easy to introduce antifreeze into the system. Uh, these are really easy to do and they work really well. If you're going to blow it out, you really don't care about this. But I have one and they work really well. Last thing before we start going through the system, unless you have a bunch of questions. Filters. There's two kinds of filters. There is the kind, it is a whole coach filter that you either put your wet bay or you put it over near the, the fixture, the, hose, the outside faucet where you hook up. A lot of people get the whole RV filter and it filters everything going in. These whole RV filters, all they do is filter out the chunks. They, they are not designed to get out the microbial and all of the other stuff because the finer the filter, the faster it plugs up. And people ask, well, how do I know when my filter's full? And the answer is, is your water flow drops way down. As soon as you notice your water flow dropping down, put a new filter in, or at least once a year. When you winterize in the fall, it, you do not replace it. You take it out and you throw it away because you do not want a water filter with garbage in it, wet, sitting there all winter growing, and then introduce it back into your system. It's all you're gonna do is get sludge. So in the fall, you take this thing out, you pitch it, and then in the spring when you get ready to go again, put a new filter in. So the best thing to do is either take a picture of the filter with your phone or save the, the carton that the filter came in because it'll tell you which one it is. And there's a lot of different filters out there. Now, yeah. So, so I tell you that you have a filter. Is it, is the purpose of that just to have better drinking water or is it going to help your trailer? Well, you remember this stuff right here. My mom's oatmeal and one of these times if you come to one you'll find out what I, why I call it that. It's it's just, yeah. the, the, the big whole coach filters will get a lot of this. They, they won't get all of it, but they'll get a lot of it. So especially when you're down in places <coughs> where they have bad water, those filters will get most of the chunks in. And they're they're in big containers usually, but it's the same size filter. But the filters are less than 10 bucks a year, they're right around 10 bucks. So you can afford to replace a filter every three months or so. But they just get most of the junk out. Is that stuff going to clog up your plumbing or collection? You put it in line with your water hose. You put it, the, the filter in line with yeah. your water hose. Yeah, but I mean, if you don't filter that stuff out, is it going to cause problems other than your hot water heater? Yes, and the question is if we don't do this, will it cause problems? And yes. Uh, it's interesting, we can tell where a lot of trailers come from because the little elbows like this and these fittings are full of this crap right here. The, the water heaters sometimes, and uh, Dave was telling the people this last week, last month, they are so full of this stuff that we have to pick it out before water will start running out. And it, it could be, you know, this deep in the water here. So it's, these whole coach filters are a good thing. Now, there, we sell a, a whole coach filter. They're like 20, 18, 20 bucks. They have a little short six inch hose. So they hook right to the hose bib. And they do a good job and the replacements are only 10 or $12. And they get, almost all of the big chunks out, so you don't have those issues with your coke. Yes? I'm sorry? Well, this, this is just... Yeah, so the regulator is always first, then the water filter, then the hose. Yeah. 
regulator is always first because it protects everything. So then there's the other kind of coat of uh, filter. First there's the whole coach, gets the big chunks out. And then a lot of coaches, they will have a secondary filter under the kitchen sink. The secondary filter, it's the one that will get out Montezuma's Revenge and most of your bacterials and, and that they, and they, they tell you right on the side, this is an expensive filter, but look, it takes everything out. And the upside of that is you can use it as drinking and potable. Potable means put in a pot and cook with it. Potable water, it's not tainted. This thing gets everything out, so even down in Mexico, this would be safe. But the problem is, is it's going to fill up really fast. And if you're in Mexico or some places where they have bacteria problems, you don't want to use one of these more than about a month. So you're going to be going through them like crazy. So a lot of people, they just go to buy Mark, Walmart, whatever Mark, and they buy bottled water. These gallon jugs of water, which are like a buck, a little more than a buck, all they are is boiled water. They just, you know, they just boil it and, you know, it's, it's pure water. You know, it's cheap, it's pure water. You have a few of those gallon jugs and you're just fine. But if you, yes? What was that in the I'm sorry? What was that in the Hydro Life is one of the big ones. This is the best one on the market. Hydro Life, good stuff. The, the upside is if you want tap water that's drinkable, this is it. But you're going to be spending a lot of money on filters. They don't last very long, but they, they're very safe. They're about as safe as you can get. This is usually under the sink, and you can buy a kit that you can put it under the sink, and it's an easy install. Yes, sir? Well, maybe this almost pertains to me, but I have one of these whole house or whole coach uh, kind of filters. Yeah. About six inches in the bottom. Right. You know, those White plastic container. Yeah. Well, it's actually blue. But, uh, okay. Yeah, we have now, blue. Yeah, now, that has a normal thread that, uh, you know, right and tidy, and it's not a reverse thread or anything. Is it? I, the, the reason I'm asking is I tried to take it off, and I couldn't take it off. So I got the little uh, wrench, wrench that comes with it, and I couldn't do it with that. Inch wrench, so I started tapping it with a rubber hammer, and after that I thought, should I just get a bigger hammer? Or uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it's never, it's never been off, you know. Yeah. I mean, so uh, this gentleman's question, he's got the big whole house uh, water filter, and it's the blue one, and there's there's blue and white. Yeah. And I'd love to make this easy for you, but <laughs> some are reverse thread. Well, that's yeah. what I was starting to wonder when I was hammering yeah. it with a little uh, rubber hammer. Yeah. So at some point, <laughs> the, the, one of the, the sad things about guys doing their own, guys and gals doing their own winterizing, in the spring, we buy a couple hundred of those houses <laughs> because they leave water in them and they split. They forget. So uh, you're not, you're not going to damage it any more than then, you know, it's not that expensive to buy a new house. Maybe I'll just buy a new house and people are get Well, if, if you've got the blue ones out there, and I know we do, take oh. one apart and see which way it goes. And, and then, the just, then just deny that you even opened it. I do you have, have a nine pound hammer at home, so I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, any other questions on the filters that before we move back to what we actually were going to talk about. <laughs> well, I got one. Can you leave the, uh, can you, when it goes up your uh, ice box, you know, with the, the water on it, and the can you leave that filter off in the back? Cut it off the valve. Well, yeah, yeah, you don't want For the winter. Yeah. And this question is, can you leave that hardwired, hard-mounted unit there? They have, all of the good hard mount filter systems have an on and off valve or a bypass valve. And all you do is you turn the bypass valve and the water goes you know, through it. Uh, the ACDCs and the, the blue one he has, 
They have a button you can push on a red button. It's a lock, and you can turn that off. But you need to take the filter out and throw it away. And just leave it off for the winter. Right? Yes, yes, sir. Earlier, did you or did you not say that that filter will prevent the oatmeal in your tank? <coughs> I. I can neither confirm nor deny my statement. <laughs> but what the truth of the matter is, if you have the, like his big blue one, the outside whole coach filter, it will take out 90% of the opening. All of the hard water deposit, most of it will, it won't get the Montezuma's resents, the bacterial and, and the sulfur smell, things like that, because those are too small to get picked up on these macro filters. But if you do the one under the sink, it's small enough, it's, it's a carbon, carbonaceous filter, it can pick up all of that stuff. So the big outside ones will get 90%. I will confirm that. That'll okay. talk about the small ones you got in your hand. This particular small one, it would financially bankrupt you if you use this for your whole house because it, it takes out everything. If you can see, this is a list on here, everything's got a yellow dot on it. So this is going to fill up really fast. It'll take out everything, you know, with a reason, but it'll take out all the microbial and... Well, didn't you say that that's where you put it? Is it the hose? No, no, I'm talking about the, like the one that he has where it's the big outside blue canister one. Yeah, this is one that goes under the sink in the kitchen. I see. Yeah. So this is more of a purity filter. Yes. As opposed to a whole house filter. Right, this is a secondary. It just goes under the kitchen sink if that's Apples what you want. Apples and oranges, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What's the one that you Good question. When we're done, I'll show I forgot so many names. I forgot the names. I know I'm busy. Put a half a tank or so in it 
just for emergencies, before you go. And the reason why we like to have that potable tank empty is so that bacteria does not grow in the tank. And you can get a lot of growth in that tank. That brings me to the occasional, uh, you want to sanitize your potable water system. When, when I was younger, we used to do it every year because the quality of water in the campgrounds was not that good. Now, two or three years, people need to sanitize their coach. And I don't remember if it's in here. No. So, yeah, it's too, to sanitize, and Dave and I have argued about this. We've been doing this together for five, six, seven years. Um, we've argued about it. I'm from Idaho, so we do things a little bit differently. So you've got a potable tank, maybe 40 gallons. And I say put a gallon of, antifer, or of bleach in there and add about five, six, seven <coughs> gallons of water. Slosh it around a little bit and then pump that bleach with water through your system and go around and open each faucet and the toilet until you can smell the bleach. And you leave it in there if you have a day, leave it in there for a day and that bleach will kill any bacteria in the potable tank, in the water heater, all these other places. This is after you flush your water heater out. But leave it in there for a day. And then fill it, the potable tank and rinse that out. What I do is if I get a little carried away with the bleach, then I go back and I put in a gallon of vinegar and another five, six, seven gallons of water. And I pump that vinegar through the system, just like I did the bleach. And that vinegar will counteract the bleach smell. Now you get a little bit of vinegar smell, but it's a clean, fresh smell. You rinse that out, flush it out, maybe run 20, 30, 40 gallons through your system. And man, that thing is pristine. Dave says you could do it with a cup of bleach and, and maybe a little baking soda if you're too big a sissy to deal with a little bleach smell. But I, I don't like the bleach smell, so I use the vinegar. He says a cup, I say a gallon. Vinegar is good with hot water, too, though. I'm sorry? Vinegar is good with hot water and hot yeah. water. Yeah, I have a nice car. <clears throat> Not the one I drive, but I have in Garage Queen. And once in a while, I get a water spot on it. I'm out there with that vinegar right now. No hard water spots on my Cadillac. Yeah, that sounds good. How much vinegar you Equal amounts. So if you're like Dave, a cup. If you're like me, a gallon. I mean, a gallon of bleach is what, two bucks. And a gallon of vinegar is a couple bucks. Can you just communicate that in your Yeah. Uh, the lady asked, can she do it in her driveway? It, it, bleach and vinegar are not on the hazardous chemical list. And if this, this is not, this is not on the hazardous material list. Uh, it's non-toxic, it's not part of the environment. Yes, sir? Um, is that putting it in a barrel for us? Is that a nervous habit or you just don't want to hang you on it? Put in about a gallon of chlorox, so like seven gallons, about seven gallons yeah. of water. Yeah. Uh huh. Then you're not filling your whole tank. Is there anything in the top of your tank? Well, the question yeah. is, is he's questioning. Okay, a gallon of bit of bleach and, and six or seven gallons of water is enough to pump through the six-gallon water heater through all your lines. All your lines take about a gallon, so that's enough to have maybe a gallon of bleach water left in your potable tank oh. and it becomes, it, it, evap it evaporates, it, it vaporizes and the bleach gets in the pores of the plastic. I mean, you, it, it's a, a very toxic environment. It's a, it's a strong bleach environment and it kills everything in there. Okay. And it kills everything in your lines and your water here. And then you rinse that out and then you do the same thing if you don't like the bleach, you do the same thing with vinegar. I like to do that because it makes it really smell fresh and the bleach smell is gone. So you don't have to sanitize your whole water tank. Or, I mean, actually, 
it will get sanitized because it. Yeah. His question is, is, you don't have a statement. You don't have to flood the tank. You don't have to totally fill it with with water and bleach. I don't want it that dilute. Uh, if there's a gallon left in there of bleach water, that's more than enough because you know it's gonna. <coughs> It's, you know, unless it's freezing out, it's going to, you know, you're going to have that bleach vapor going around the inside of that tank. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there campgrounds that have wells or are you using well water at all doing this more frequently? The latest question is, is if you are doing it at home on a well, should you do it more frequently? Um, I live out there near Love Lake. And got great water, but I understand that there's areas around here that don't. Um, the crap in our water isn't bacteria, so it's not, yeah, it's got some, you know, mineral deposits and a little lead in areas, but it isn't bacterial, so it's not going to affect the bleach system. You can use your well water to find The bleach is not a hazardous material, so you can run it out on the driveway. It's just you can't do anything. That's the one thing you can't do. You have to be very careful of engine oil, transmission oil, and, and cool. But RV stuff is fine. Okay? Okay, on the line two. <laughs> line two. Oh, so low point grades. Every coach is different. I cannot tell you where your low point grains are. If you don't have an owner's manual, you've got somebody that can slide on their back underneath it, you're looking for two to three lines coming down, usually after the rear axle. It, does, it doesn't, it's just anywhere. So you, leave, you see these two lines coming down, some of them have caps on them, some don't. And you go up inside the coach, okay, that came through the floor there, so under the bed or wherever, there's your two low point drains. You open those, and if the coach is under pressure from the pump, the water's gonna just start rushing out onto the ground. That's how you know you found your low point drains. You can hear that water just going. And the whole point is, you wanna open those low point drains and get all of that water out of the coach. When it's all out, turn the pump off, and now the bottle tank is empty and the low points are open. Open all your faucets and everything will naturally go out. It'll, most everything will drain out. At this point, we take the water heater drain plug out, rinse it out, do that, get it ready to go, flush it. Remove your ice maker, put the uh, bypass petcock in the bypass. Remove your outside shower hose and wand and put them inside somewhere because you can't get all the water out of that wand and people freeze those shower, outside shower wands every year. We sell a ton of them. So put it inside somewhere where it's going to stay warm. Somebody tested it and used it. So it's like, if you take it off once and drain it out, you can really use it and you don't put it out. If you turn the knobs on, it will be a new one. It will make it easy. If you're blowing it out, if you open up the outside of the water, the valve, all that, all that out. The question is, is if, if, open the outside shower hot and cold, won't the air blow that out? Yes and no. We've, we've had a lot of them being replaced even though people say they've winterized it. It's just easiest to, uh, they have a lot of little veins in them, you know, near the head of that thing and they tend not to get all the water out. They, 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 for whatever reason, they tend to crack quite easily. The, the first year they're fine, next year, they leak and drip and they have all sorts of problems. Third year they work. But so you can take that off, don't you? When you're blowing it up, don't you need to open up the manifold for that? Well, you get to open the, the first thing.
thing you do for the outside carriage, you, you have the wand and then the hose. You just unhook the hose at the faucet fixture and take it in the house, put it somewhere, and then at, when you're going around doing your blowout, you open those faucets, they'll just shoot right out. Okay. Excuse me. So, I didn't say anything about the ice maker line. Uh, how many of you guys have ice makers? Okay, ice makers. On the back of your refrigerator, you have a small quarter inch water line. And the way we do it is we unhook that line. Ted, when we're doing an ice maker on a refrigerator, do we unhook the line or do we just hot wire the valve and unhook the water line after the valve? I hot wire the valve, but I put a 5 amp fuse in it so that it doesn't turn the valve up. And Until you, un you unhook the line from the valve yeah, to the... I just energize the valve and blow air through it until the ice maker cycles. I got it. Air. Okay, thank you. So... That way I don't have to take anything apart. So, what... What he does, and he's master certified, he's the best one we've got. Uh, anything he says is true. <laughs> Excuse me. So anyway, with your ice makers, all he does, and I think this is right, is he hooks a hot wire to the valve, hot, you know, 12 volts, opens the valve up, and then when he blows it out, it blows air through that quarter inch water line, through the valve, up into the ice maker, and then you just flip the bale up and down a couple of times and it will cycle and it will blow any water out into the ice maker. When you're all done, you take that little 12 volt jumper cord away from the, the water valve and you're done. That's how you do it. And if you're not sure, see me after and then we'll work it out. Okay, so watch for ice maker. Have a on the, on the water inlet. 
we, we have a fitting that we put antifreeze into the washing machine. And we run some antifreeze through that washing machine. We do a part cycle. And we, we turn it off <coughs> in cycle. But there's a half a gallon of antifreeze in the tub of the washing machine. And I believe that's how we do it. Then we put it all back together. So in the spring, all you do is run a cycle on your washing machine and it flushes it through. Uh, again, this, I've never done one because I got into management before I got that smart. <laughs> but I can find out if you want to know. Now we're down to, uh, we've already talked about removing the filters and all of that. We're down to that quarter cup of antifreeze in the P-traps. I, I like the cup. I'm not, you know, it's not that expensive. So you're, on your kitchen sink, there's only one P-trap. And so usually if you're standing there looking at it, the P-trap's on the left side. So pour the antifreeze in the right side. Just kind of rinse the water if there's any in out. And it'll all end up in that P-trap. And if you pour a cup down there, or a plop, whatever, it's not science, you know, it's easy stuff. That will displace the water and you're good to go. When you're done with the, you go from shutting your faucets off to putting a cup of antifreeze in each trap, don't forget to do the shower. You, did, you need to pour very carefully about a cup down because there's a pee trap right under the shower. Make sure you pour your cup very carefully because it'll stain that fiberglass and plastic. If you get any antifreeze on a plastic sink, wipe it right up and maybe a little moist rag with water on it. Get that pink off of there because it will, if you leave it, it'll stay. When you get to the toilet, you take your stick out. You do not put any antifreeze in the toilet because if you put some down the toilet, it's going to sit there and your toilet right at the valve will be stuck together. You'll have a nice heavy pink ring. It's, it's not pretty. Um, just close it. If you want to do something good for that toilet ring, if you have any uh, petroleum jelly or anything like that, put your foot on the toilet valve, it'll open it up, and you can take some of that and wipe it around the underside of that black rubber seal, and then take your foot off and it'll close it. That petroleum jelly will, it's like hand lotion, it'll keep that, that valve seal moist. And that's what you want to do. Some people say, oh, put some water down there. No, because it's going to freeze. And they say, well, it'll right up. And because the tanks are shaped like a cone, the, the antifreeze, the ice will right up. And it's best just to put a little bit of Vaseline or something on there and just leave it dry. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Back to three. The monitor You should stop. The, the latest question is, is her holding tank monitor, one of them stuck. So you need to come to our RV basic seminar and we'll explain all that. But what we're going to tell you is, and no happy camper isn't going to pay us to endorse their, their uh, product. But for those of you who come all the time, Dave's always pitching Happy Camp. He likes to talk about poop and he likes to talk about Happy Camp. So the problem is, uh, for your coach, you have a little foreign material, some organic or uh, tissue debris on one of your probes for a monitor panel. And it's stuck there. And the only way you're going to get it off is to and you don't do this at the time of winterization, you do this in the spring, and then you, you use Happy Camper every time you go out. What, Happy Camper is an enzyme. It's a biological chemical, and it eats beta cellulose and organic tissue. I mean, that's 
It's like me going to Prime Rib. That's, that's what it likes. So you put, if you have a problem with your probes, you put half of one of those $10 a little buckets of happy camper down it and fill it with water about three quarters. And then slosh it around a little bit. What we do is we get the forklift driver to drive it around the shop a couple times and then let it sit for an hour. If you take happy camper and a little water and sprinkle it on a nice wooden coffee table, come back a month later, you'll have a hole in your coffee table because that's beta cellulose. And this enzyme eats beta cellulose. And you say, well, why do I care about my coffee table? You don't. What you care about is the toilet tissue that you use is made out of beta cellulose, wood fiber. So you want a toilet chemical that will digest the toilet paper because it's like a map and it builds up in the bottom of your tank if you don't use chemicals. So your issue is you need some of that toilet chemical and you need to let it sit, but not when you're winterizing. You do that in the spring. Uh, so anyway, the curious that is, and you use a one ply toilet paper and not the it or the will be right. Well, at least this time you didn't say we should do it like the Europeans do. That's just gross. <laughs> That's just gross. <laughs> Anything. So this old guy that introduced me to the RV industry, he said, if you want to understand toilet paper for an RV, get an empty, clean mayonnaise jar, quart mayonnaise jar. Put three or four pieces of toilet paper in it. Put the lid on it, let it sit for 10 minutes and shake it up. If it comes apart and tur turns milky, it's great for your RV. If it stays laying on the bottom of the jar like a mat, don't use it on your RV because that's what it's going to do in the bottom of the tank. So, being the guy that I am, um, I, Charmin seems to work, the old stuff did. Uh, we. We, my wife and I, use that Costco, I think it's Scott's, and that works good. You just have to, whatever you like, I know MD is popular, but I've never tried it. So whatever you have that you like, try that. Put it in some water and see if it dissolves. That's, that's all it is. If it dissolves, use it. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you brought it into us, we would we would the first thing we do, even though you're sure that your rig is broken, we would do that. We would put half two thirds of tank. Uh, we dump at least half of one of those in there. Put half two thirds of tank of water in it and let it sit, drag it around with a forklift a couple times. Usually within an hour to two hours, it will take care of something like that. Some of them are really bad. Uh, we had one in here the other day that was so bad that we had to have one of these port potty guys come and pump it out. Um, but he did a good job, cost 200 bucks, but it was, it was nasty, but he got it out. I'm afraid to do this, I'll tell you that, because of the master. I was told to put a bag of ice cubes in there, right? Mm -hmm. Good thought. You did, you did the right thing. I'll get to that in just a second. Okay. Yes? You mix that antifreeze with water, will it expand? Yes. Water, that will not stop water from expanding. His exactly. question is, if you mix water with that antifreeze, will it stop the water from expanding? No, it will not. Water will naturally expand no matter what you put into it. Well, I was just thinking when you pour half a cup of it into a trap, it's going to combine with the water that's already in there, not push it out. You know, in a perfect world, you may be right, but the density of the tube and the inertia, if you look at it, um, we have even taken them apart to see. And no, it'll just push it right through. And it's the same thing with, he, his, his question is, 
if you pour antifreeze down the trap, won't it just mix with the water in the trap? And my answer is no. And we've, we've actually entertained that idea and look. Um, and the same thing with, you've got your, let's say you want to winterize your coach with antifreeze, and you pump it through, is that antifreeze going to mingle with the water in the water lines? And if you watch the way the water comes out, the low point drains, it's water, 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 water There's no commingling almost at all in that. So we do not worry about that. But then that's, I will give you partial credit on that because that's why I like to use a little bit more than the minimum amount. If I pour a cup down there, that's more than enough to displace any uncooperating water. Not a gallon. No, but a cup will work. Yes, sir? Yeah, if you think you want to get out of the way before you worry about antifreeze it, use the toilet filter. Yes, yes. Okay. You had a question and I was going to finish it. Yeah, I don't know. It's like a bullet. Oh, it's an ice. I'm not afraid to do that. Yeah. So, um, um, the, the, the gentleman's question is <clears throat> some people tell. I don't know if they do it just to laugh at them, if they actually do it or what, but I, we hear this a lot. Well, my buddy told me to put ice down my toilet and then, you know, it'll, and some, well, I use gravel because the toilet, because the ice melts. Yeah, so anyway, we do the same thing. Are you really going to put that in there, especially if you have a macerator? No. Ice melts. If it's 70 degrees out and you put that water and ice down in there, that by the time you get that done, get in your rig and drive it around the block, the ice is melted. The only thing to use is an enzyme. I don't care if you use half and camper or not. Don't use, when, when I grew up in this industry, Thetford sold a lot of RV tree. I think that was one of the brands, Thetford and RV Trade. They used formaldehyde and blue dye. Oh, and oh it got to the point in the 80s in Oregon, you, you, all of our free uh, dump stations just disappeared because they were putting so much formaldehyde in, in, that, in, the, in, our, in our water table that they had to shut it down. Well, we've grown up and we're better to Mother Nature than we used to be. This enzyme started out in, and I know this for a fact because I, I used to read a lot. In 1889, Sears and Roebuck had American Chemical selling septic tank starters. They didn't know what this stuff was, but it really helped break down the stuff in your septic tank. And that was in 1889 in the Rosie Krubuck catalog. So that's the original. That company sold out to Happy Camper out of Drain or somewhere down here. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Anyway, and we've been selling this, and we now know that it's an enzyme, and this enzyme eats the stuff in the toilet. And that's the only right way to do it. Any other stuff in there isn't going to do you any favors. And the macerator is just a very soft rubber impeller. And if you, I mean, it's strong enough to chew up the organic tissue and, and the toilet paper, but it, there's two issues with them. Anything other than that, uh, dare I use the word condom, or anything else, or, you know, Q-tips or anything, you just ruined your $285 macerator. So nothing else goes in that other than those two items. So the other thing is macerators, you cannot run macerators dry. And a lot of them, they tell you that you turn it on after you open the valve, and then when you hear the motor rev up a little bit, you turn it right off. Then you throw a bucket of water back in, you rinse it out, and then you come out and you turn it back on. But as soon as the RPM goes up, you shut it down because they burn out Less than a minute. They just boom, they're gone. Because they're, they're very soft. It's just how they are. Okay? Yes, sir? I just put a question on the 
it's not long enough. But they make them that are about four feet long, and most RVs, you can push the valve and look right down into the tank. If you can, we have these flux sticks. You hook to your hose, and you stick it down there, and you can blast it out. Yeah, you certainly can. Yeah, they work. Flush sticks? I'll show you what they are. Yeah. You can call it whatever you want. Okay, any other questions before we... Okay. Well, I'm glad you guys are having a lot of fun here. You should come to RV Basic because you love Dave talking about food. Oh, look at here, number 10, immediately clean any antifreeze off the toilet and sink bowls and counters. It will permanently stain. I think I said that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I told you not to put any in the toilet. Use a little Vaseline around the O-ring, but no antifreeze in the toilet. Did it say put antifreeze in the toilet? Number 10, immediately clean any antifreeze off the toilet. Huh. Talk to Dave about that one. <laughs> yeah, we don't use any antifreeze near the toilet. We use this stick to prop the valve open and blow it out. But we don't put any antifreeze because there's no sense of putting any in the tank because there's not going to be any water. Put your name on it. So that's what we do. Um, this is, I guess, for the techs. Um, you don't need to sign it and date it and pull the fuse. Uh, you know you did. Uh, the only issue is uh, if you do winterize, you need to make sure that you, when you dewinterize, that your bypass is back in the normal use position where the valves are in the direction of flow. How do you access those? How do you get to the back of that? Well, you get some small person to crawl in underneath the cap. <laughs> do you have a fifth wheel or a trailer? Okay. Um, you go outside and figure out where your water heater is. Yeah, you go inside. Fleetwood, one of their better ideas in the mid 90s, you had to actually pull the toilet out and then you take the four screws out of this panel and then there was a water heater but you couldn't get to the water heater with the toilet there. So they, they don't make it easy for you. So you figure out, you locate the inside, you crawl in there, they're usually under the sink or under the bed somewhere. <coughs> People can't do it, I can't do it. You have to get down on the floor on your side and reach in there. That's what these guys are for. But if you can find the back of the water heater, if you can get to it, you can do it. Also, living in the Willamette Valley, I'm sorry? He said, living in the Willamette Valley, it doesn't freeze very often. Right. When it does, we have lots of warning. Is there any reason to not just keep the trailer plugged in and keep the heat at 60 degrees? Second best question of the day. The question is, why not not winterize it and just leave it plugged in and put some heat in it? You know, it's, it's one of those catch 20 days, <coughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. Let's say that the same guy I told to leave his black valve open, I said, you know, and then this winter, don't winterize it, just put, put a couple big heaters in there. Two things are going to happen. Number one, the electrical system is going to overheat because it's not designed for such a heavy constant current. You have one little cube here takes 15 amps. And if you have a trailer with a 30 amp service and you're trying to charge the batteries and you run two heaters, you're over, you have exceeded the 30 amp rating of that trailer and you have your little 100 foot vacuum cleaner cord plugged in and that thing's gonna get so hot from resistance it's gonna melt. And I have been, I have witnessed in Idaho 
people plugged in, doing the same thing. These farmers won't spend two cents. And they have this old cord that they use, and they run it out to their grandma's trailer. And then after a snowstorm, you can see the line in the snow where the cord was. Because it got that hot and melted. So we don't recommend heaters. Maybe one if you plug directly into a good outlet, no extension cords, because there's a huge voltage drop. Your house is permanently connected tight. These are loose, sloppy plug-ins. And if you drop down to the 15 amp plug-in and plug into a wall outlet, you, you've gone from 115 volts to maybe 90. And Ohm's Law, if you're at 90, Volts, that means you've got to have 15 amps to do a, do a 10 amp job. So it, it's just, it's, it's not good. So not heaters, but what about the furnace that is in the trailer? Why not yeah. keep that at 58 degrees? Not a problem. Now you can use, yes, your furnace. You can use your furnace. You're going to buy a lot of propane. But if you only do it during the times when it's going to be really cold, not a problem. Buy a little propane. Make sure that you're plugged in so that you've got your batteries charged so that the furnace doesn't, you know, pull the batteries down. Problem number two, and this is the one that's going to hurt. Let's say it's 25 degrees outside. Let's say it's 53 inside. Aluminum frames on your windows, they're 25 degrees. That moisture inside the coach comes up against the aluminum window frame and condenses and runs down and rots the perimeter of the window. The paneling and the framing starts to rot almost immediately. So if you're going to keep your coach warm during the winter, you've got to have a way to get that moisture out of there. You've got to have humidifiers. You've got to make sure that it is dry to less than 10 percent. I'm interested in it, and my house is usually is around 35 to 45 percent. So to get it down to less than 10 percent, you've got to really work at it. If you're in a coach living in it, and, and I, I learned this the hard way. We had sold 100 years ago a park model to these people while they were building their house, and they were living with three girls this park ball and he said my roof leaks and I said no it doesn't you've got five people in there each shower you're going to put a gallon or two of water in the, in the air when you breathe you're putting water in the air when you cook on the stove for every gallon of propane you use you're putting a third of a gallon of water in the air all of that moisture condenses you think your trailer leaks but it's just condensation so they ended up they wanted to sue us, so I said, I tell you what, we're going to buy a refrigeration type Sears Kenmore dehumidifier. It costs us less than 300 bucks. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit in there for a week. If the problem doesn't go away, we'll bring it in and we'll fix it. Problem went away. So if you're living in it, you've got to have a way of getting rid of that moisture from living. Cat litter dries and stuff. Something else you Well, I think what you're talking about is what if you come to RV Basics, and Dave and I argue about this all the time. I like to use Dries a Year. Dries a Year is a potassium chloride crystal. Uh, it is not hazardous to the environment. It's only hazardous if you leave it on the dinette and drive away and it falls on the floor, then they're going to clean it up. But dry as the air, you put the crystals in the container, it, the salt absorbs the moisture and it drips down into the bucket on the bottom, and the salt water doesn't evaporate. Then once in a while you pitch it out, reload it, works great. Dave doesn't like that because it can be messy. Dave likes the new ones that are in a disposable packet. It's a very similar product. It's, it's a diatomaceous, porous uh, carbonate type thing. And 
if you put it in the closets, wherever you're going to have high moisture, and when it, I think it turns, I don't know, I've never used them. When they're done, you pitch them out. They're a little bit more money, and I'm cheap, but uh, those work well. Now, for years, this one company sold this dehumidifier, and I just shake my head every time I think about it. You plug it into 110, and it's got a cover, and you take the cover off, it's a square thing about like that, and it's got a light bulb in it, and it creates a small amount of heat. But where's the water going? It isn't. So it was a big sham. So as long as you have a way of getting rid of it, the best way is a compressor type household dehumidifier. Uh, but if you don't want to use one of those, then these uh, dry years, one in the bedroom, one in the bathroom, one in the main living area. And if you have a big coach, you know, two in the main living area, whatever. But they work well. But to answer your question, to finish you out, if you keep heat in it, you better have really dry air or you're going to start having butter condensation moisture damage. Getting back to winterization, after you get to like step 10, it seems like you're going to have liquids inside your holding tank. You need to go flush them out again? Oh, you can dump it. At the end, the very end, you close the, one of the last things you do is close your valve. And that's where, when I do, I don't close my valves. I just put an old cap on it with holes in it, and, and anything that's in there, it, it'll breathe and, and, and dry out. We never really close those valves again. And, and what we do, if we, let's say you bring it in, we're going to put that termination collar on there, crooked, so the bottom half isn't attached. That way, that any water left in there is going to run out. Aren't you putting a gallon or so of water into that tank? when you're doing the blow-out process? Well, maybe if you go back to the way that I do it, the way we do it, is the first thing you do is you go open your low points and your water heater, turn your pump on, and, and you pump out everything out of the potable tank. And then you, you, if you open a couple of faucets, after you turn the pump off, everything is going to pretty much run out. Most of the water is going to go out. You may have a few cups left. Now, if you close your low point, and you close the water heater and go open a couple faucets, hook your compressed air back up, and you go from faucet to faucet to faucet, always too open, and you just let them run for a few minutes until they're absolutely not spitting any water. So what's gone down the tank, you may have put a gallon down there, but it's going to run out. And then when you're all done, you close all your faucets, and you take the stick out of the toilet, at that point, you go put a cap on your head, but you don't close your valves. Okay. You leave your valves open until the spring. And on my motor home, I have uh, the black, that black tanks have a freshwater flush system. Yeah. Uh, how do I, do I put that same air pressure in there to get the water out of that? You, yeah, because it's just a, a, a little reed type flash of the, uh, rubber thing that just like a spastic. Oh no anyway, yeah, they're fit in the tank. Well, <laughs> we have. So anyway, <laughs> it's a long story. Anyway, um, yeah, just put air pressure in there for a couple minutes, just just to blow any. You know, okay. Those things, they're a gimmick. We we don't. If you wanted us to install one, we probably would. Um, they're they don't work that well. It's, if your holding tank or your toilet's here and the dump's over here and they put it over here, it's not going to spray at anything. And there's not enough water pressure and volume in that to really do any good. We have, we, it hasn't been a good thing for our industry, so we don't see it. Yes, ma'am. So the application of both methods and winterization is if you don't intend to use your trailer as material in the Willamette Valley until next mm -hmm. spring,
question is, she lives here in the Willamette Valley, and she's going to go once in a while. Does she really need to winterize? The, the answer is, um, if you go, let's say you go from here to the coast, it's not going to freeze on the coast, you're fine. You know, even if it gets down to 30 that one night in the month, it's not going to be a long-term deep cold that will cause you any damage. Plus, if you're over there, you're probably living in it. So you've got plenty of heat. So, probably not. But, you know, three or four years ago, remember, I was out of power for 10 days. Uh, it, it was cold. It was so cold, my wife went to live with her sister in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it, it is not for me to tell you you have to winterize your coach. Everybody is different. I'm here to tell you how and to get on the high spots. Um, we have more than enough business uh, at Guarantee RV. Um, we would prefer to help you do preventative things because uh, we have enough business. You know, we, so you know, it's up to you. If, if, if it's in a, it's interesting, I like to garden, and it's, it, I have this shed kind of thing, it's just white canvas, and it's on the side of my garage, certain times of the year, I put it up in the spring, early, like, first of March, and I start my seeds and stuff, so, it's 40 degrees outside, you walk into that, and it's open with flaps, you walk in there and it's 50, 55 degrees, and it's nice and warm. And the point is, you know, it's not really warm, but it's it's typically about 10 degrees warmer than it is outside. And it's the same thing with your coach. If you have it parked on the side of your house or somewhere, and it's 35 degrees, it's probably 40, 45 degrees in that coach. The only time we start getting really nervous is if it's going to drop down into the mid to lower 20s. Because usually when it gets that cold, it's going to stay cold for more than just a couple hours overnight. And that's when we get into trouble. When we're cold for two or three days, that's when we're in trouble. Yes, ma'am? you put dryer sheets all over your camera? I'm sorry? Yeah, dryer sheets from ice. I cannot see a reason why to do that. Yeah, they're, they're, what, what are you else? saying? What are you saying about dryer She's saying dryer sheets. I was told. Where? Who runs the heating company in Florence will need to put pumps or valley to keep the rats in ice. Put it under the hood. Lots of sheets to keep the rats in ice for nesting. I have no idea whether it works or it's a waste of time. So, so the only way I can answer that is um, you got to stop hanging out at that campfire that he's hanging out at. That ain't gonna fly. Uh, I, there's no chemical in those that would do anything to absorb moisture or you know. That's a whole other topic about mice, and they, they, they love to chew on silicone, so if you have a hole, don't silicone the hole. Uh, steel wool seems to be the one thing they don't like. They won't chew on steel wool. Uh, I don't think rare sheets are going to help you anymore. But, you know, hey. Uh, so, my motor only has a, somehow out of the engine heat can go back and help the hot water heat. Gentleman's question is: He has a Winnebago, and they like to use Motor Aid because they always have. And it's kind of neat stuff. Motor Aid is a, in your engine. There's a T in in the line to the the hose that goes to your heat exchanger for your dash heat. 
So they run this hot engine coolant from the radiator back uh, up the frame rail. I don't know why, uh, but it heats the frame rail, but it comes out and goes through the water heater and a little bit here and there and back down the frame rail <coughs> to the radiator. His question is, uh, does he need to worry about that if he's winterized his coat? And I'm going to say at best that the water line may hit 100 degrees, and it is not going to affect and, and if you look at your water heater, the well a aluminum tube that's U-shaped comes out like this, and then the, the, the radiator fluid comes in, goes right across here, it comes out, so it doesn't even go inside. It's just warming this water heater at best 100 degrees. It will have no effect on it whatsoever. Okay. Now, why they run that line up the frame rail, I don't know, because if the water is 185 degrees at the radiator, you're lucky to get 100 degrees out of it, you know, at the frame, because the frame rail is going to suck the heat right out of that. And they use black iron pipe to do it. But they've always done it, so God bless what they make. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> On your uh, seat here, um, after you um, opened up the drain of the hot water heater and the water plates, blowing it out, then we close them up, and the next step was to uh, run the water pump until it's free filtered, it's free of water. Well, it's really a free filter. I mean, the country really doesn't have a water filter, so. So, again, I didn't, I, I wrote this, but uh, I, I, I would do that the other way. What I tell people is, and I'll answer your question, but I prefer once you get, you, you open up your low point drains, you take the plug out of the water heater and flush it out. And during that time, I turn the pump on and pump out anything that's in the tank. Okay, now after the the well, if you've already emptied your water then, then there's no need to do it. Now at the, your, your at your potable water tank, you've got about a foot of hose, then you got the water pump. On the inlet side of the water pump is a little pre-filter. It's it's a uh, sediment filter. Okay. It's for big chunks. Yes, that's where it is. It's attached to the input side of the water heater. Or water pump. Okay. Well, so if you drain your water tank, yeah. so there's still maybe a little water in the line that you want to turn the pump on to get that water out? Um, we do, and, and this is a good point actually, we, we have had occasional problem with that cracking because sometimes when you're running the pump dry, it doesn't pull everything out of that, and you can just turn that filter 90 degrees and it'll come apart. And occasionally we don't get everything out of that. And like one or two a year, and we do a thousand a year, and we might have one or two that are actually cracked. And that, and because they're just a little clear plastic. They're, and there's no pressure, you know, it's just yeah. a small plastic filter. But, so it's okay to turn out of your water pump until there's no water, more water coming right. out. So, it, like I said, one or two a year may not get all of that water out, yeah. but if, if it's not that big a deal. You're not cheap. Put the water out, dry. I'm sorry. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, that's not the water pump dry. The question is, is will it hurt the water pump if you run it dry after maybe 12 to 15 hours? Oh. <laughs> they, they are 12 volt motor, and if you look at it on the pump head, it goes around and it goes like this against the diaphragm. And it's like a, a Mazda rotary Wankel engine. It's, it's a rotary pump, and the diaphragm has three different valves. So, it, and what it does is it pushes each valve like this, like a small piston. But all it's doing is going around, and it's this 
the face of the diaphragm, the aluminum part, is just going like this and it's not even spinning. And it's, it's a pretty cool idea. And there, because the only thing that's moving is the motor, everything else is pretty much sitting there just oscillating. It can run for hours. So, yeah, there have been stories where people turned it on, they left it on for months. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I've run my crate. Um, I just wanted to ask you about uh, the disable the water heater, the 110 side of the water heater, so that in the spring when you dewinterize it and you put water in and you turn it on, it's not going to fry the water heater if we didn't get water right. back I, in. Well, I, I understood the technician part of it, but there, the, sentence, the sentence it's itself, no. I don't it's quite... It's a typo. It should say a note. Note. Okay. Yeah. It just said yeah. not. Okay. Yeah. All right. That makes more sense. I was in engineering. I was a horrible <laughs> writer. <laughs> but that's all right. You did good. Any other questions? We uh, we we really consumed our two hours. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.